Let's begin by telling you that the River State Police Command has confirmed the explosion that the Secretariat of the Action People's Party, APP, in Port Akant, along the GRA axis on Monday morning. According to the command spokesperson, Gray Seringe Koko, a team of bomb experts has been deployed to the scene to investigate circumstances surrounding the blast. He disclosed that the State Police Commissioner and other top officers have inspected the party office to gather first-hand information. Iringe Koko confirmed the explosion damaged some property. Investigation into the explosion has also been launched. This incident comes amid rumors of political tensions in the state, with speculation surrounding Governor Malai Fubaru's alleged plans to defect to the APP with his loyalists. Earlier, social reformer, author and thinker, and the active joined us on the news to speak on speculation of Fubaru's possible defection. Completely what has dominated the political firmament in River State for a couple of weeks now, um, in that uh, a lot of us, a lot of political pundits believe that um, the PDP has become too hot for the governor uh, and is seeking an alternative platform um, that he would use to actualize some of uh, his blueprints, if you may. Um, you are just seeing that recently, even though against certain judgment from the courts, and the PDP have gone on to organize their, you know, their elections for representations even up to ward level. And uh, it excluded the family of the doctor, as it were, the political family of the, of the um, current governor, as it were. And therefore, there were a lot of people who came in to woo the governor, um, like we are aware of, uh, to move from the PDP instead of remaining in the PDP and getting continuously embarrassed. And so this was the what was in the political firmament until um, we saw what happened, you know, um, today uh, regarding the blast of the uh, office of... The Nigeria Labour Congress has tasked President Bola Tinubu's administration to stop the blame game reverses policies that have caused hardship to Nigerians and engage in meaningful dialogue with relevant stakeholders. This, among others, were contained in a communique issued at the end of the Emergency National Executive Council Meeting of the NLC held at the weekend. Similarly, the presidential candidate of the Labour Party in 2023 poll, Peter Obi, said the just-concluded nationwide protests were a call on Nigeria's leaders to re reflect deeply on the growing poverty in the country and take steps to address it. Former National Vice Chairman, Northwest of the ruling All Progressives Congress, APC, Sally Hulukman, spoke in the same vein, describing the nationwide protests against hunger and bad governance as sufficient grounds for impeachment of the president and some state governors. The Senate on Sunday tackled former President Olusha Obasanjo over his comment that lawmakers in both chambers of the National Assembly fix their salaries. In a statement, Senate spokesman Yemi Adaramodu challenged anyone with credible ev evidence to present contrary facts. Adaramodu said the Red Chamber only receives the salaries allocated to it by the Revenue Mobilization Allocation and Fiscal Commission in line with the Constitution. The lawmaker who represents Ekiti South Senatorial District in the 10th National Assembly also emphasized that no senator has received any financial patronage from the presidency. The United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, has emphasized the need for every Nigerian child to have a legal identity which can be possible through e-birth registration. In collaboration with the National Population Commission, the global agency highlighted that the transition from an analog to a digital birth registration system will help government at all levels have sufficient data to make plans for children in the country. News Central's Ayo Ulubusi has more. Birth registration is a fundamental right for every child. Without that, a child is invincible. Hence, the birth of the SDG 16.9 which aims to provide legal identity for all by 2030. In this vein, 
The United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, in collaboration with the National Population Commission, is urging Nigerians to adopt the digital birth registration process in giving identities to their children. A registered child has acknowledged rights to uh, protection, but also to health care, education and other critical services. It is very important without child registration, those children remain invisible to our governments. It also presents an, a huge opportunity to create a very robust and reliable civil registration system that not only records birth, but also generates vital statistics that are, as you know, necessary for effective planning and implementation of policy, but also for budgeting. Beyond birth registration, the digital system will help to link individuals' data with the national identification number and other common records. This is why we are particularly also more, more interested in working with, with the health sector, you know, um, primary health care centers, uh, hospitals, for example. Once we know that once we have, um, you know, an understanding with, with, with all of this, and then they have these centers where they can issue birth certificate where they can register children. The moment children are taken there and they are registered and they get a certificate, they are not only getting uh, just the birth certificate, they also get the I, um, NIN number. And then uh, the other opportunity for health is that those children that are brought there can also receive immunization. For adventure, maybe water got into this, this office of fire. We may not be able to retrieve all the information in our, in our ledger, all our registration forms. That one is gone. And it becomes a problem in case of verification. But when, you, when it is e-captured, you understand, you can easily you know, retrieve all these things. Touting is, 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 and is a menace in Lagos State, mm. where we have people that you know, impersonate and issue fake birth certificate to people. And that is one of the advantages of e registration. If adopted by all and sundry, e birth registration will be a reliable data bank system for an effective planning and policy implementation for all children in Nigeria. From Lagos, Nigeria, Ajo Ulugusi reporting for New Central. International Youth Day, celebrated annually on August 12th, was established by the United Nations to draw attention to issues young people face as well as celebrate their potential in today's global society. This year's theme is From Clicks to Progress, Youth Digital Pathway for Sustainable Development, which acknowledges and celebrates the power of young people and their contribution to digital innovation. The theme highlights the key connection between digital technology and improving the progress of sustainable development goals, emphasizing the crucial contributions of young people in this transformative process. Earlier, UNICEF Deputy County Representative Dr. Ronak Khan joined us on the news to speak on this. Technology would allow them to also acquire the 21st century skills. As you may know that in the uh, uh, World Economic Forum, there are few 21st century skills that have been identified for young people. And uh, digital skill is one of them in addition to problem solving, um, um, uh, in addition to critical thinking, so on and so forth. So um, as I was saying that the, the digital technology will allow them not only acquire skills, but also it will allow them to raise awareness about it. They can hold the political leaders also accountable to their digital power. But in order for them to do that, they also need a lot of support, both from the government side as well as the communities around them. Shockingly, 80% of containers that get to the Nigerian port leave empty. Experts say this costs the economy about $1 billion annually and highlights deeper issues with non-oil exports. Exporters face high costs as a result of limited, limited infrastructure and bureaucracy that stifle trade. The process of shipping goods is tedious, requiring excessive paperwork and fees at multiple government agencies. Once cleared, 
goods face delays in assessing scarce dock space and equipment to load ships. These insufficiencies or these inefficiencies that added expenses squeeze already tight profit margins that discourage exporters. Producers also struggle to access finance to fund operations and trade. Local banks see investing in exporters as risky, charging high interest rates if they end at all. This limits firms' ability to produce at scale for exports, upgrade technology and meet world-class standards. And to unpack this, I'm joined by Temi Son Omat Sheye, uh, who is the former Director General of the Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency. Good afternoon, glad to have you join me. If you can kindly help us on mute, uh, I can barely hear you. Oh, good afternoon, and thank you for having me. All right, I can hear you now. It's glad to have you join me. Uh, let me kick off by asking, you know, empty containers leaving Nigeria's seaports represent missed opportunities that Nigeria needs. Why do so many shipping containers leave Nigerian ports empty? Um, first thing we need to realize is that Nigeria seems to be an import-driven economy. Uh, we seem to be doing a lot of imports. But unfortunately, um, as a country, we have left our core business, which was exports, most especially of the agricultural produce. I'm, I'm sure if you remember in the 60s and the 70s, Nigeria used to be a major exporter of commodities, agricultural commodities out of the country. But what has happened basically is that there's been no focus on agricultural production and other um, things on the inland. And therefore, what has happened now is that a lot of things have been imported, a lot of goods have been imported, but not a lot of goods have been exported. So most of the containers that come in with imported goods are having to be sent back to their home country empty because we're not having sufficient cargoes to put on those containers to send them back um, hmm. to their countries of origin. Well, indeed, tackling these issues head on could transform the exports landscape and also Nigeria's economic prospects. But then, how do we address the real issues and turn our exports, I mean, woes we have in exports, into wins? Well, what is happening right now, really, truly, is um, the challenge is that people are not very encouraged to do export right now. Um, because one, um, the, the most important thing, which has to do with the infrastructure, um, as you must realize, most of the goods that are being produced are being produced in the inland. So you take areas like the east where they produce the yam or up north where they do a lot of agricultural produce. So there's not a lot of level of processing which allows the goods to be maintained and whatever. But the worst case of this all is the fact that we are dependent on a monolithic port, which means everybody wants to take their goods to Lagos. And many a time, because of the inability to get into Lagos ports, this has actually led to a lot of containers being left stranded or being left, and many of the goods going bad, which has made it totally unprofitable for exporters to carry their goods to Lagos. So we need to begin to think out of the box and begin to think about utilizing other ports. I believe that Nigeria very quickly needs to develop an agricultural development port, a port which is specific, specific for agricultural produce. And it doesn't need to be in Lagos. It can be in Wari, it can be in Port Harcourt, it can be in Sapele, it can be anywhere else but Lagos, where Exporters of agricultural produce take their goods there, and most of these processes need to be automated very, very quickly. Mm. Well, you've touched on very key components there. You talked about the level of processing and also containers not being grounded. But then the time it takes to clear goods from Nigerians, you know, Nigeria's uh, seaports compared to other neighboring West Africa countries is very huge, making us lose businesses to them. How can we reduce the cargo dwell time to be efficient? and also competitive. Okay, now, I don't know which one you're talking about. You're talking about the imports or the export right now, so one can actually focus on those ones. Let's look at both the of them goods. briefly. Oh, okay, the imported goods, what needs to happen very quickly is that we need to get back to a situation whereby we do a lot of pre-inspection of cargoes before they even leave the port of origin. And what that means is that we can identify clearly. If it means we have to send custom officers to the ports of origin and they can carry out their inspection and digitalize this process so that when the goods land in Nigeria, duties have been paid and they're leaving the ports almost immediately. We also need to have a process whereby we have a standard operating procedure for exports so we know those who are going to inspect so that once we digitalize it, the exporters can go on a web or on a, on a, on a, on a, or whatever the case 
and get a pre-inspection of these goods so that once the goods arrive at the port, because they're already stuffed and whatever, they're just loaded on board the container and are taken out of the country. I think this will quicken the process and will make Nigeria more competitive when it comes to imports and exports of cargoes in Nigeria. All right. Now, with oil production declining, you know, declining in Nigeria, uh, Nigeria must take action to diversify its economy through competitive non-oil exports uh, by streamlining its processes. Now, what do you think we can do, or do you agree with such submission? If you do agree, how can we begin to diversify? I, I think it's time for us to leave the to, to take our eyes off the oil because oil is becoming a diminishing commodity. And I believe that Nigeria is a very blessed country, um, especially when it comes to mineral resources. I think we need to go into an area where we need to go more into deeper industrial mining. But that will not solve the problem because Nigeria still lacks the infrastructure to evacuate these goods after they've been mined to take them to a, to a port, a deep sea port where they can be exported. The most important thing is that Nigeria is going to be competing internationally with the likes of BHP, Rio Tinto. Those guys are doing deep, big, big, big mining. But in Nigeria, our mining operations will take place in the interland, in the plateau, in the Zamfara. And those goods need to be moved in the most economic way from those areas, especially either by rail or by water to a deep sea port where we can use deeper vessels that can carry up to 200,000 tons so as to reduce their cost of freight. With that being done very quickly, that would allow Nigerian goods to be more competitive because if we're not competitive, we'll not have a market for our end products. But we need to diversify away from oil focus more on gas, drill more gas wells, build more LNG plants, and also go into a lot more mining and also begin to export more mining like iron ore, tan light, and all the rest. That is where Nigeria's future lies. No, not, in my personal opinion, no longer in oil. That's my thing. Well, and indeed, agriculture, of course. Well, indeed, and we manpower. Do. Oh, all right. <laughs> well, indeed, we do hope we can diversify as a country and also nip the bird when it comes to export, yes. uh, export revenue loss. Thank you so much for your expertise on the news. Temi Somacheye, former Director General of the Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency. Many thanks indeed. Thank you for staying tuned. And now to more political stories. Nigeria's opposition People's Democratic Party has accused the former governor of Edo State and member of the All Progressives Congress Adams or Shomole, of deliberately misleading Nigerians of Edo, or citizens of Edo State over candidateship status of the PDP governorship candidate of the state. The PDP spokesperson says the lawmaker and former governor deliberately misrepresented a recent court judgment in order to deceive citizens of the state. Our correspondent, Amadine Uyi, tells us more. It was a short briefing by the spokesperson of the opposition People's Democratic Party. The spokesperson accused all progressive Congress of deliberately misleading citizens ahead of the Edo State governorship poll, especially in relation to a recent court ruling which the APC claimed disqualified its candidates for the upcoming Edo State governorship poll. What Comrade Adams O'Shaughnessy did is reprehensible and is condemnable. Coming to the national TV to lie. This is the court judgment, the court of appeal. And the judgment was rendered on the 22nd day of July. And just for emphasis, I'll just read a particular part of the, that judgment to you, which was the last concluding part of it by the, by the presiding judge. It says, in view of the resolution of all issues, all, all issues, and I will come to the background of that, for determination against the appellant. It follows that this appeal lacks merit and it ought to and is hereby dismissed. He challenged the APC to present its candidate for a debate. We want a debate. That is the essence of democracy. We are mirroring America according to us in our process. Right now, the president candidates are suggesting three debates in September, in one month. Now we have an equivalent who will not commit to. But interestingly, we have information that a national outlet, a TV station, has invited him for tomorrow, Monday. And we're saying to him, it is in his interest, it's in the interest of educated people 
that he comes out to appear in that show so that people can ask questions that is agitating the Edo people and of course Nigeria to know indeed what manner of character of people seek to public office. The PDP spokesperson also accused all progressives Congress of being unprepared for the poll, but trying to distract citizens of the state. In Abuja for News Central, I am Amadin Uyi. And now to security matters. Niger State in Nigeria's North Central has become a home of competing factions of insurgents. Data from SBM Intelligence revealed that 275 residents of Niger State were killed in 24 incidents in the second quarter of this year. Several times, the Bola Chinobu government had vowed to deal with the rising security challenges of the country and protect the lives and properties of the people. The state of insecurity, however, appears to be worsening with each of the six geopolitical zones dealing with multiple safety and security challenges. In the last 12 years, Nigeria has been battling many security challenges from Boko Haram and Iswap insurgent groups and banditry to kidnappings. In recent times, the North Central region, particularly Niger State, has been severely hit by bandits. In the past seven years, the state has been reported to be under the siege of bandits and in this period, 18 out of 25 local government areas in the state have been attacked by these bandits. Seven of the 25 local government areas in the state are reportedly constantly overrun by bandits and other daredevils. Niger State accounts for a critical infrastructure essential for food and energy security in the country, and there is heightened risk of a crippled economy as the number of attacks in 2024 looks set to outrun previous years. Brown News State marked a hopeful new chapter with a historic football match between Guane Valencia and Aminu Babes at Ramat Square in Maiduguri. The Peace Cup football competition attended by the show of Bronu and other key personalities was a celebration of the region's return to peace and stability. Umaru Kirawa tells us more. A heave of relief to most residents of Maiduguri, the Borno State capital, after experiencing the years of insurgency. If you go to Subdebra, if you go to Mamri, if you go to uh, Ngala, if you go to other local parts in Medjugorje uh, and environs, people go about their normal businesses. This is a sign, an indication, that uh, Borno is bouncing back to its lost glory. And uh, this is something to celebrate. This is something to give Almighty Allah uh, all glory and uh, adoration. The return of socio-economic activities is changing the narratives of the retrogressive years of attack. The Shehu of Borno, alongside other personalities of the Kanin Borno Empire, are here to ginger the morale of the youths. From all indications, with this kind of sporting activities, the issue of youth restiveness will be reduced to the barest minimum. We are just picking up from the crisis of Boko Haram in the state. So we want our youth to be engaged always in uh, sporting activities and other activities. So this is my first time since his tabling as a as a royal eminence of Borno State to attend in a in a in a, in a, in a match like this. So I can call them they are the most locus among their caliber or among their peers. As the saying goes, um, there is a British leader who once said I will engage the youth, even if destroying the famous London Bridge and rebuilding it back again, just for the uh, reviving back our lost glory. Borno has come back to peace again, once again. You see the youth; they are trying in Borno State. They are obeying the rules and regulations of their fathers. They are obeying the rules and regulations of their leaders. The Peace Cup tournament has not only garnered the support of the local authorities but has also attracted the attention of the broader community. Football is the only thing now in Nigeria that unites people. You know, you see Christian, Muslim, uh, Yoruba, Hausa, United. Even in our team, we have Christian, we have Muslim. The competition is very entertaining, and the way youths have conducted themselves, it is very interesting. In football, we speak the same language. In football, there is no religion, no tribe, nothing. All what we know is the round ladder. And uh, football actually engages youth in peace building, unity. And then to say, even 
it serves as a means of creation of job. The Shehu of Borno had this to say. Alam Borno is a Mavarazi, Allah Governor de Barazi, President de Barazi, President Jaman de Sama, Allah Sea Barazi, Allah Tadandia, Ferrande, a little Borno is a Mosola Sea Barazi, Allah Fitna, a little Dent, absolute Nigeria, a summon abs, Zoras, Lungana, Allah Balimine, Kafua, Clefas Lena, Allah Kandesa, Amdilla. The enthusiasm and joy on the faces of the youth during these matches are truly inspiring. The football match is not only a display of talent, but also a symbol of peace and resilience in a region that has faced many challenges in recent years. In Maiduguri for New Central, Umaru Kirawa. And now to education matters. The West African Examination Council has withheld the results of 215,267 candidates from the 2024 West African Senior School Certificate Examination. Now, this figure represents 11.92% of the over 1 million candidates who took the examination. And speaking on Monday while announcing the release of the 2024 WAEC results, the head of the Nigeria Office for WAEC, Dr. Amos Dangot stated that the results were withheld in connection with various reported cases of examination malpractice. Dangot stressed that the council would continue to sanction all cases of examination malpractice, noting that schools, supervisors, teachers and candidates involved in such practices were undermining the educational system. Thank you for staying with us. The news continues in Southern Africa, where a new report from the United Nations Aid Coordination Office reveals that food insecurity levels in Zimbabwe are rapidly deteriorating after it was hit with historic drought due to the El Nino weather pattern. Earlier this year, Zimbabwe's president, Emerson Nangagwa, declared a national disaster to tackle the prolonged drought crisis. Nangagwa said the country needs $2 billion to tackle hunger caused by low rainfall, which has wiped out about half of the maize crop. The grain shortage has pushed up food prices and estimated 2.7 million people will face hunger. Neighboring Zambia and Malawi have also recently declared state of emergencies or disasters due to drought. And to discuss this, I'm joined by Professor of Climate Change, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and that's Tasfadzwa Mabawadi. Good afternoon from here. Glad to have you join me. Good afternoon. Thank you. All right. Uh, can you provide, you know, an overview of the current drought crisis in Zimbabwe? I mean, what factors are contributing to its severity? Uh, so the drought is mostly due to the El Nino, the El Nino-induced drought that has struck the region, uh, including countries such as Zambia, Malawi, and Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe in particular, the drought resulted in more than 50% of the maize crop being lost or failing. And in a country where the majority are rural farmers and relying on the harvested maize for food and as a livelihood. This then translates into what we are witnessing now, the massive food shortages and the pressure to then import food then results in increasing food prices and with people facing unemployment and poverty, that also means that people cannot afford to access the food, which is now more expensive. There are also other interlinked things that are happening because of the drought, such as worsening water scarcity in Zimbabwe, uh, declining water levels in Kariba, which is increasing uh, load shedding in terms of energy shortages. So it's really a mix of several issues that are combining to translate into the situation that we are seeing now. Mm. Now, let me follow your uh, thought process. Beyond food, which you have referenced, uh, beyond agriculture, what other implications of this drought is being felt in communities in Zimbabwe? Yes, so the, I mentioned uh, the energy crisis because the main source of power being hydroelectricity from Lake Kariba 
low levels of water in Lake Kariba mean reduced electricity generation capacity. A lot of households in Zimbabwe also rely on boho water, which is groundwater, and a lot of these boholes have been drying up, which means reduced access to water, safe water, and that also means you know reduced access to sanitation and hygiene. So you've got issues that start to energy, issues that start to water, sanitation and hygiene, and ultimately health as people now have to rely on unsafe uh, water sources that may be polluted, resulting in things such as you know, cholera happening. Mm. I mean, uh, uh, quite a, you know, a, a very critical point you raised there about energy resulting in water crisis, sanitation there as well as also food crisis there in Zimbabwe. But then what measures would you be looking forward to by the government to help, you know, profile solutions in adapting to this challenge facing uh, people in Zimbabwe? Okay, so drought is in itself complicated. Uh, it is also integrated and evolves slowly. The government, uh, what is needed were immediate measures to mitigate the food insecurity. And I think that was part of the aid call that was done by the government to request aid to supply food to people. There's also need to ensure access to water. So drilling boreholes, uh, massive boreholes in areas so that people have access to water for domestic use and sanitation and hygiene. There's also need, which the government has been doing, to rechannel resources during the winter growing season to increase the area under irrigation and produce more wheat so that the drought implications, especially in the summer, they can reduce imports for things such as wheat. There's also need for them in the long term, looking into the season coming up ahead to start planning because we have got a La Nina coming up this season in terms of what crops can they now produce and how can they recover in very quick terms and increasing boosting food security, especially in rural areas where it is most needed and urgently needed. So a range of interventions across agriculture, boosting productivity, boosting water supply, and also ensuring energy supply, especially in rural areas. Mm. But would you solely attribute this challenge to climate change? And if so, how has it affected drought in Zimbabwe over the years? So we wouldn't uh, attribute it solely to climate change. As I said, it's a combination of factors. Uh, climate change, of course, is, is resulting in an increasing incidence of drought, as well as an increasing intensity of drought. So we are seeing more droughts happening frequently. There are also other factors that are structural, which limit the government's capability and the people's capacity to be able to cope and adapt. So if you've got high levels of poverty, high levels of unemployment, it means the people themselves have low capacity to respond to these situations when they happen. That's an issue that is structural and economic and also social. There are issues such as lack of access to water, which means there's need to invest in water supply infrastructure, augment the current dams that are there, increase water treatment capacity. So the range of other issues that were already at play, and then when a drought happens, you know, those things are exacerbated and also amplified. Hmm. All right, thank you so much for your time on the news. Professor of Climate Change, London School of Hygiene, Tsavadzwa Mabaudi, many thanks indeed. Thank you. Mozambique, renowned for its breathtaking landscapes, rich cultural heritage and vibrant communities, over the weekend hosted its 10th Fikani International Tourism Fair in the capital, Maputo. Now, this year's event attracted over 6,000 delegates from across the globe. A new centrist, Bongani Iba, has details from around the globe gathered to celebrate and showcase Mozambique's cultural richness from its tantalizing cuisines to its vibrant traditional music and dance. This event highlighted not only the beauty of Mozambique,
but also its potential as a premier destination in Africa. Uh, Mozambique is, um, I used to say it is um, uh, a place where the tourists make, make, uh, make a difference. Uh, and this type of uh, uh, exhibition is very important for us to know what is possible in this area and uh, uh, the, the products that has been uh, exposed. This is the most important Mozambican event to promote the tourism and promote our destination, but also uh, we think it's the most important event that we have to get together with other destinations as we as we had uh, South Africa here as we have Nigeria we have uh, Kenya we have partners from Rwanda as you could see so this is very important meeting so we can exchange we can make business and we can sell our and promote our destination the event featured engaging workshops that immersed participants in Mozambique's traditions fostering a deeper understanding of its local customs and promoting cultural exchange. Working together as the continent, to put the continent on the world map, is so important. Uh, Inter-Africa travel and trade is also very important. Mozambique is a key market to South Africa. Just this first uh, uh, four months of the year, we welcome over 660,000 Mozambican visitors to our country. And we come here and to hear how, where can we improve, how can we work better together. With its vibrant art scenes, unique architecture and warm hospitality, how can tourists resist the allure of Mozambique? Participating in Fikan is really to really seize the opportunity we get to see in Mozambique, but also the continent as a whole, as we got to see many countries joining Fikan really to come together and collaborated to continue to grow Africa as a whole. Figani International Tourism is not just a celebration, it's a platform for critical discussions on the future of Africa tourism, with delegates sharing ideas on how to enhance travel experiences across the continent. Mozambique is in fact uh, has everything, has uh, uh, nature, has uh, just like I said, so beach and bush, meaning that it has all the high qualities for you to have good programs and to, uh, what's, what's needed, it's to structure the, the, the offer, you know, you need to, need to bound, you need to bound the partners so they can with less do more. One key theme emerged is the need to open borders and simplify visa processes. To travel in the continent is very difficult. So we need to do a lot more about increasing air access between the various cities within the continent. We also have to make it easier when it comes to visas. You know, we all have different visa regimes and regulations. And sometimes it's difficult, you know, for people to get visas. So if we can have a continental visa like the European Union, for instance, the Schengen visa, it will help us a lot. We have to still work a lot in our internal connectivity as Africa. From Mozambique, as you imagine, to, to get to Rwanda, it's very difficult. We have to take flight to Johannesburg and then to get, get to Rwanda. It's very difficult still uh, to have the connectivity de uh, um, developed. So we still have to work a lot more. As ideas were exchanged, Mozambique's cultural richness inspired nations to develop their own tourism industries. The FICAN International Tourism event underscores Mozambique's pivotal role in shaping the future of tourism in Africa, delegates forge new partnerships and friendships, creating a ripple effect that transcends borders. It's always an exciting period for us to be in Mozambique so that we could interact with um, tourism businesses in Mozambique so that we can obviously continue to enhance our relations and promote Mpumalanga's tourism offerings. As the event drew to a close, the spirit of celebration took over. Delegates swapped business attires for dancing shoes, showcasing unique dance moves from their homelands and weaving together a tapestry of cultures. Maputo, Mozambique, for News Central, Bongani, Siziba.
You're watching News Central now. Let's take a quick break. The news continues shortly. Thank you for staying tuned. Rwanda's President Paul Kagame has been sworn in in another five-year term as Rwanda's president after winning a landslide election victory last month. Kagame took an oath at a ceremony attended by several African leaders at a packed Amahoro Stadium in the capital Kigali on Sunday. He pledged to remain loyal to the country, defend its constitution and laws, preserve peace and national sovereignty, and consolidate national unity. Kagame ran under the banner of the ruling Rwandan Patriotic Front in the election on July 15th and won with more than 99% of the vote, beating his challengers Frank Abeneza of the Opposition Democratic Green Party of Rwanda and independent candidate Felipe Mpayimana both received less than 1%, 0.53% and 0.32% respectively. In his inaugural speech, Kagame highlighted the role of the country's spirit of unity in his election win. Algerian firefighters have been battling blazes in the northeastern Kabila region as families were ordered to evacuate. Residents were told to leave homes in the fire's path in Tizi Auza province though it was not immediately clear how many people were affected. Numerous wildfires have, been broke, have broken out in the region since Friday, though most of them have been brought under control or were expected too soon. Authorities in the Bajaya province near Tizi Auzan ordered the evacuation of around 20 families from the village in the area, which is located near a forest where blazes reached on Sunday. and that's all on the news. But let's take a look again at some of the major stories. Labour has urged President Chinubu to end blame game, halt bad policies. Paul Kagame has been sworn in for fourth term as Rwanda's president. We also told you that families have flown countries northeast as wildfire rages in Algeria. Send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen and follow us on social media. We are at News Central TV. You can watch us live on DS TV channel 422, Star Times channel 274, Avo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Adebola Adeduba. Duba.